Yeah. You're on TV, man. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for uh, <laughs> for coming today. Uh, Brent, that's our forest and forest health. Uh, my name's Jim Hamilton. I'm the extension director uh, here for Watauga County. And uh, before we go, we get get started. I do have some uh, just just a couple of things. Um, uh, Living Web Farms is actually recording this and live streaming this uh, this event, I think. And we will uh, they're going to be here to sort of you know spread the knowledge and love that we've, that we've discovered here uh, in the high country regarding the protection of our uh, of our of our hemlocks. Uh, but before that, uh, the Wi-Fi code. I don't know if some of y'all in the back will be able to see that is on, on uh, up here on this sheet of paper uh, if you need to access Wi-Fi for any reason. Uh, bathrooms are in the back of the room or in the back of the conference center out the doors to the right. Uh, there's some coffee and, and water and please you know get up if you need to take a break stretch your legs. Uh, we're we're going to take this thing fairly in, in, uh, informally. Uh, informally. Um, what we're going to do we're going to start out um, Dr. Uh, uh, Dick McDonald who's been sort of leading the charge um, for the promotion of, of using uh, biological, uh, pre uh, biological treatments for our hemlocks. We'll be here to sort of give you a, a, a big picture overview of what's, what he's been involved with over the last 20 plus years in, uh, in trying to protect and conserve and save our hemlocks. Um, so we'll be inside for a minute and then afterwards we're actually going to go outside and quote unquote meet the beetles. Uh, the beetles are active. He saw some yesterday and this morning while you're we poking around. So we do have the Laracobius beetles in the hemlocks right around the ag center. So we're going to uh, we're going to uh, he's going to demonstrate how to uh, how to uh, how to capture, catch, identify the beetles. A uh, neat ID tool for uh, for beetles amongst uh, amongst other wildlife too. Great great way to ID uh, whether or not you have have the predator there. Uh, so after that we have. Um, uh, Blake Williams here is a program assistant for Ash County Extension. Uh, so Blake and I did a, a survey as part of his uh, uh, part of his senior year um, at ASU uh, so, sort of senior year project. Is that what you could, it's sort of an internship slash project? And we sampled Laracobius or sampled for Laracobius across the county. Um, he's going to share the results of that survey that we did in the fall. Um, Jerry Moody and Lear Powell, who just, just walked in, uh, are going to sort of talk about um, hemlock management and uh, uh, woolly adelgid management in the context of, uh, of the landscape, as in for the landscaper's perspective. Because there's a different dynamic with hemlock woolly adelgid in someone's, you know, in someone's uh, uh, vacation property or second home if there's a hemlock that's sort of a, a treasure tree on their property compared to those hemlocks that are, that are in the forest. And there's a level of protection uh, uh, that, the, uh, uh, that the predator beetles provide that's a little different than the traditional chemical treatment that we're used to, uh, that we're used to doing. So that dynamic will be, will be discussed as well. And then um, when we finish sort of the, the last round inside, for those of you who, who want to accompany Dick, Dick's going to be taking a group out to uh, Grants' gain sort of prominence as a, uh, uh, as, a, as a treatment in these large POAs, property owners associations that we have here. So um, we've got a, uh, got a lot planned, um, but we would like to t you know, make this as informal as possible. Please let us know if you have any questions um, along the way. If you have those questions, ask Dick because he's the expert on this. But uh, No leaders here. Yep. Dear pal, he's here. Guest people. Still waiting on Jerry. Jerry's not here yet. I spoke to Jerry. He's coming. Yeah. Oh, I know he'll be here. Um, so for that, I introduce Dr. Rich McDonald. Okay. Welcome. Started. I'll back up since Jerry Moody isn't here, and just give you a little bit of a background history lesson before I get going here. But um, I started working with Jerry, Jill, and Jeff, the Triple J's in Avery County, along with Doug Hundley. I had met Lear Powell and we were all doing work on balsam woolly adelgid and looking at whether or not if we modified the orchard floor management of these Christmas tree farms if that would affect, uh, would, if that would improve predation against balsam woolly adelgid, balsam twig aphid, elongate hemlock scale. 
And long story short, we did, but that stuff ended about 25 years ago. Um, and I began to get into hemlock woolly adelgid. I am a graduate of Virginia Tech. They had gotten this oddball beetle in their lab in 1997. And I was following this along and working with Fred Hain and Felton Hastings. And then in 2002, I got this phone call out of the blue from Stan Sturry. And Stan said, hey, I know that hemlock woolly adelgid is causing a big problem. Gina, at that time her name was Gina Luker, and I traveled up to Virginia Tech, and within the first 15 minutes of me being up there, I realized I couldn't raise this thing in the lab. You have to keep the temperature below 73 degrees, and if you have a little tiny sprig of the uh, of adelgids, it's got to be changed three times a week because these beetles eat them all. And so suddenly I realized I couldn't do that, and I called Nancy up, and I said, I need to change one word in that grant that you gave me. that. You know what I mean? Normally find benefits that work as as this thing. Me talking with him, the thing that he is here once you realize that you have these two types of trees in an area or at hound ears or at grandfather golf country club you can gently tell some people because the best thing that you can do in some circumstances is take a chainsaw and cut that stuff down really bad And the reason is a picture of the is what the and that's reasons I got in this program because I said well maybe there's something that I can do maybe maybe the hemlocks aren't totally doomed and I committed to this program okay and so I was hemlock woolly adelgid you're going to see that the hemlock woolly adelgid is still native there are natural enemies you start Started actively thousand years, we watched the hemlock forest die. And then suddenly we got a information I had moments in this program. Okay. That's what I would call them. Okay. The first one was DNA. And it turns out that that thing is native to the Pacific Northwest and that it has effective natural enemies and there are hundreds of eastern and carolina growing all over Puget Sound as a in the winter on a day like today or any time in the winter that it's above freezing or actually above about 28 degrees hemlocks are getting sun they're not a house canopy out here. They don't compete when the leaves are out. They wait till the leaves drop. They is out here to block the uptake of that. And this adelgid, this generation of so it's really important. 
can use this B liberate every day that we began to see goes out is all of a sudden within the next season these trees that we shrubs that we had put beetles on had leaders on them a foot long because suddenly they were getting all this carbohydrate back okay <coughs> we were we started moving beetles um, I'll, I'll give you a long story short uh, us folks in the mountain we don't like to do our because by 2006 Delgid was native and predator was here so we could turn time and start getting this where larger organizations uh, in the winter at Virginia Tech Out what level of beetle and adelgid doesn't hurt the tree. Average 175 feet tall. I think it's because of this beetle. But I might be maybe. So we realize we call this with Laracobius beetles. Okay, now since that time, you guys know most of this area has been infested. But this was the game changer for us. I'll show you the beetle, and this is what we'll talk about in a moment. Right, it breaks in summer estivation. This thing synced with and feeds on six to eight a day what it's doing is it's prepping itself for that cold period in the winter it's going to get a whole bunch of fat bodies and then we might have what we had this time where you know January and February is just cold as can be and they just go down and hide in the or to get warm again once it gets warm again okay in tunnels because you're going to find we'll find all the it is right now they don't North side of grandfather and uh, north side of of uh, Howard's and that whole area, all those beetles tearing up the adelgids and laying eggs. And so we'll see the first week that I was in Seattle, David Mazel and I dissected 1,200 ovus sacs and opened them up to see whether there was a Laracobius in them, how many eggs there were, and what the predict. Okay. But I, all you got to focus on is the bottom bolded line. We had 50% of the ovisacs disturbed, uh, and 47% were were eaten by predators. 50% of them had an egg in it. So if you get 47%, right away, 97% of a delta. And this was like I want to. It's going to happen the next year in the very spot. Had the see this today, by the way. We're, we'll get a scope out and we'll go. Stuff. We'll see larvae and we will see adults, as far as I'm down at the bottom. That Laracobius egg is bright, big, yellow, and under an ultraviolet glow. So you can see all. And you put ultraviolet light on this thing comes out becomes that last matrix moment that I told you about where we can find out what's going on. What happens, female beetle will lay an egg in an ovary. Over here just for a second. Um, out west, the adelgid ovisacs average 175 eggs per ovisac, which is huge. You know what I mean? They are big. They are healthy. These are big trees. It's the Pacific Northwest. Everything's a little bigger. 
So all that, so every larva has to eat 220 to 250 eggs or crawlers, okay? So I average that out to 235. Every female beetle lays 400 eggs. Every larva eats an average of 235 adel um, a, um, adelgid eggs or uh, crawlers. So one female almost kills 94, or about 94,000 adelgids die. Now, out west, all they have to do is go from one oversack to another to get 235. When we were doing our study at Grandfather, because it was so cold, we only had 24 eggs per oversack. So that meant those beetles were laying an egg, and then they would count a dozen oversack. Normally we do about 50, and, and then we can come up with that egg number and predation rate off of that, okay? In Seattle, you guys, this, the very limb, I counted all the adult along with David Mazel, on this limb, one of the ones we had in our study site, the very next year, there were four oversacks on that limb. The predators had knocked that thing down by 99.9% .9 to the point where just enough, you can see there's an adelgid there, there's an adelgid there, that's the whole site so sparse that the beetles aren't interested in it except just to kill an adelgid. If they happen to walk by and see one, they're going to eat it and kill it. So this project in the city, in Seattle, takes five to eight years. Never happen. Once these beetles go, once the forest goes back into balance, it'll happen if you have a lightning strike or a drought or you know tornado or hurricane where you've got stuff that's stressed but in that um, in the areas where we put these things out into forest and you'll see that at father golf and country club today it's been since 2007 since pesticides were applied on any trees of any size in there and they all look great because they have these bees and so in a game of numbers it was about a Eradicating this adelgid, it was about knocking the number down to the point that it didn't affect the trees anymore. Just going to be quick. This in the rest of the East Coast because. There, beetles on, and there's beetles. Uh, these guys in a minute. So, we main in pint ice. So ice cream was no longer ice cream. It was a Laracobius container. And I had to eat those just to make sure. <laughs> this is now from where it has learned about Spanish moss and put just Um, I've shipped them off to Pete Gurdon for a week and went to Pete's office and I said, what the last batch of beetles that I sent? <gasps> they were still in the refrigerator upstairs and he'd forgotten about it. So I Bang. Well, we opened that thing up and no, none of the beetles were. They were. You almost have to try it. That's one of the reasons we've been successful, right, is these things have established in spite of what we do, and now they're everywhere. We would make a speech. We had extra. He'd give them to me to do, and you and I take a where those big beach
Jacob put be and he's pounding away this is pictures in your guide sheet by the way this is how we collect this is a this is a tree in uh, Lake Park called Woodland Park these these are all hemlocks out there they're all this big they're all about 120 feet high they have a big on them about the half With the Delgins, they've and I want to know whether Pete did it close. Look in there. There's umbrella and all the stuff. or rain and that's a, that's a sunny day in Seattle. Okay. If you look up close on that beach sheet, you're going to see little black beetles. They're out there. I, I did one beat day out here and I was getting. That's part of the corner, and there's three for people. If you go work and see what's going on, okay? So we would suck these things up with an aspirator in a park in Seattle or Puget Sound with an aspirator, it looks like you're inhaling various inspired rangers that are always and they do is they say, dude, that's they'll still bust you back here first and then I'm like, no, 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 come here, look at this. I'm not I'm not so little in one of these uh if you got tested, I operators company out of business things, but if for people that need them, we can get set up to do it. So now I'm dumping a hundred beetles pint cups, a whole bunch of food, or I can else or whatever, and then we can overnight things by lying. You can't tell the beetles. They won't do it. So I go up best one tell you guys these are wife's gloves if that guy's married well he will break the law to make sure that that those gloves are overnighted to your wife because he understands the importance of those gloves okay so those things get shipped overnight they get out we just we do uh, we do evaluations and I'm going to these next slides pretty quick. Release site number one. We have beetles on that tree and it's beetles. We need on a tree like that. To do that at grandfather because I was able to go to their board of directors, shark tank them, and they gave us enough money to go out and when we could put that amount of beetles on these trees, in a, in a four year period, we put out 14,000 beetles at Grandfather Golf and Country Club and they quit using pesticides because we were getting, you could see the adelgids just being gone. It breaks it into patch dynamics. That goes on. So here's the first beetles that we found the very next year. This is 2004. This is after Hurricane Francis and I, by the way. That area got 46 inches of rain and we still were picking up beetles because they're from the Pacific Northwest. They don't care about rain. Okay. We're beating on the trees, we're finding these beetles, we're going out twice a month, we're doing all that stuff, and they, I had to break protocol because Virginia Tech knew who I was, and they said, now, you're kind of, you to break rules and do these odd things, so we want you to follow this protocol. So for a year and a half, I followed that protocol, and then I was at one of these sampling sites, it's a nice and cold, I said, if I was a beetle, I'd be up in the sun up here on this hemlock. So after a year and a half of not finding any, I walked up onto that, 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 that ridge. The first beetle, I got six beetles, which all of a sudden I realized these beetles are in sun tunnels in the winter. Growth protocol. I began to find beetles like crazy because now I was going where the beetles were rather than following some fixed sampling approach. Okay. So we're going out, we're taking a 40 foot tall, that's a 40 foot pole printer to get samples off of there. 
And the other thing that we will see outside when we pound now is we're gonna see these bigger larvae. You remember that little larva in there with all those little eggs? Look at this guy now. This guy's been going around, cruising around, eating those eggs. The other thing that I like to see under the scope is when those crawlers are going by, that larva will grab a crawler and grab it by the head and bite off a chunk and blow it up and down a few times like a balloon and then suck it in and just pop it off its side. After seven years of watching trees die with no cure and thinking it was terrible, I just love to watch this stuff happen. It's like revenge of the, of the force. Okay. The other thing you can see up there, look at that oversack. See that oversack and see all those eggs there? That's about 30 or so eggs. So what we would end up doing is we count all that and we count about 50 oversacks that are undisturbed just to kind of come up with what the average is. Every year it varies because it depends on if it's cold, hot, how long it's cold, how long it's hot. But at Grandfather, we dissected about 10,000 oversacks and back then, this is before the polar vortex by the way, we got about 24 eggs per oversack because it's nice and cold there. So that red bar is showing that the larva is showing up and when we got to about a third of the oversacks having an egg or larvae in it, we realize now there wasn't enough food. And what these things do, they immediately turn and attack each other. They're just like human beings. It's great. When they get stressed, the first thing they do is they go kill the smaller one of them. And ladybugs do that too. That way they stay in an area. If you think about it, if they've eaten the food out of an area, now it's just down to 10 larvae of various sizes. Those larvae are gonna look at each other and they go, I think I can eat you. And, but they stay in that area. See, they're still in that area. So that's why we would always find these beetles in low, medium, and high density, okay? So here it is in, in uh, Banner Elk in 2010. This is after that 2003 release of 300 beetles. We started finding them a half a mile away. We started putting them out at Grandfather and we kind of felt like those beetles were just going in every direction off of that mountain. Every time there'd be a windstorm, I'd call Pete up, say, how far do you think those beetles went, Pete? And Pete would go, well, Mr. PhD, the winds were blowing at 70 mile an hour. How far would they go in an hour? And I'd go 70 miles and he'd go, boy, you are smart. So here's a diorama of Grandfather Golf and Country Club from up at the top of Grandfather Mountain, but you see that 18 hole golf course. And in a, in a four year period, then we released more than that. But that, that was an operational release of beetles in this area, okay? And then once they get going, now we don't need to go out west. We can go out here. We can go to various spots around here that have adelgid hedges. And as long as we manage them, we can sell and move beetles, okay? So here, here would be 2012. Here you are by 2014. We knew that beetles were out all in this area here. They had dispersed out because we had been putting beetles out. And I'm gonna let Blake talk about the other thing, but I, I'm gonna flash this up because it was here. And that is the recoveries that, that he is gonna talk about later where we had releases and recoveries. Now, the other thing that's been happening is it's, done, it's not only working here. The reason that it worked here and it worked so well is we have spruce, pine, fir. We have, every one of the conifers has an adelgid, right? So pines have pine bark adelgid. Spruces have coolie spruce gall adelgid. Firs have balsam woolly adelgid. So when we dropped this beetle into the high country here, it was like it was back in the Puget Sound. It had everything it needed. The whole buffet was there. They reproduce on pine bark adelgids too, by the way. Okay. So now we go up to Delaware Water Gap. And the reason that I knew that it should be established up there was I was the one that sent these guys all their beetles from Seattle. And when I first went up there, they said they couldn't find any at all. The reason was they were using a white beet sheet pounding onto, uh, onto a white surface and those larvae look white and they couldn't see them. So the first thing I did was show up with a colored umbrella. The very first beet I got 12 larvae and I realized that part of this is training people to see things the right way when the head of the program who's not an entomologist tells me that there's no beetles in Delaware Water Gap and here's what I find. Not only are they everywhere, but look at the ones out 35 miles to the west. I was staying in a hotel out there at Hickory Run, near Hickory Run State Park, okay? So this is years ago now. So this area is totally loaded and uh, Lear sent me a really nice uh, article where Forest Service is moving beetles 
from the uh, from Rocky Gap into the Flight 93 National Memorial because they have hemlocks there. And in the past, they would have been resistant to this. But we were the people that showed these guys first how to use this thing. And then I'm going to do one other thing here, which is I want to show you guys how this works under ultraviolet light. Okay. I'm spending 100 nights a year in a hotel in Seattle down. <laughs> I can only afford $50 a night, and that puts me with working rooms on either side of me. Let's just put it that way. And my hotel was run by Ukrainians. And the smallest, the smallest Ukrainian I ever met was about this big. And he ran, he ran the, the hotel. I had read in my bug journals one night that bed bug poop glows bright green because it's a blood feeder. And so I decided to go to Archie McPhee's novelty shop in Seattle, which for those of you, that is like this crazy shop. You know, it's got uh, three foot long plastic roaches, you know, all the stuff that entomologists just absolutely need. So I went there and I bought two ultraviolet pen lights. I went back to my hotel room. The very first thing I see is bright green poop going down to the, to the plastic baseboard. And here's a whole family of bed bugs. So I put one in a vial and I go up front to my buddy. And I say, you've got bed bugs. How do you know those are bed bugs? I have a beep beep PhD in entomology. Okay, I have something for you. He walks over to a cubby hole and he pulls out a, a card and it's a Starbucks card for $20 of coffee and he gives it to me. <laughs> and in the meantime, I'm thinking because I'm looking at this guy and I'm like, whatever this guy gives me, I am accepting with pleasure <laughs> and saying thank you. Now, one night, my wife happens to be gone to Raleigh, and I go and do all my crazy, uh, I call it Mad Sigma. So I go out under a hemlock that's right near me that I knew had Lercovius beetles all over it, and I took that pen light and shined it on the tree, and here's what I saw. Let me see if I can turn off this front light here, because we can see some of this a little bit better. We're going to see this live in action, too, by the way, okay? I start seeing this orange stuff and I can't think, okay, so I clip this branch and I bring it in and every ovisac that's orange, I touch it with a needle and a Laracobius larvae jumps out. Suddenly I realize this is predator poop. Predator poop glows bright orange because adelgids have quinones in their blood. And that's how they're, that's their antifreeze. And so all the predators that feed on adelgids when they poop, their poop glows bright orange. Well, the only predator that's out this time of year is this beetle, okay? So we have samples over here, and we'll go out and do some other ones. And you can see this bright orange poop. And the other thing that you're seeing, um, and it's hard for me to take these pictures with an iPhone, but this is what we had to do and use time-lapse photography. This is chartreuse, this color here. I had to learn fluorimetry colors, by the way. So that's... That's yellow-green, that's your antifreeze color. And that's the blood of the adelgid. When the beetle bites the adelgid and feeds on it like a vampire, it leaves blood splatter just like vampires do. Okay. So here a beetle has eaten an adelgid, and here is predator poop coming down. You're gonna see this, so you can take this flashlight and go out you can either clip some and go to a darkened room or go out at night and light it up. And if you have this, you don't really need to treat. If everything else is good with your hemlock, you've shown that the, the presence of the adelgid there. If you have an intact ovisac of the adelgid with a little honeydew on it, it glows blue-white. Okay. Here's a bunch of blood splatter. So here's blood splatter at Lee's McCray. Nobody knows about it. But there it is out in the forest. There's, if you could hear these adelgids scream, I bet it would sound really <laughs> terrible. Ay so, we published this. This is a published, yeah, you can turn um, This is a published paper. Um, I have this in digital form for you guys. Um, 
And uh, the chemists in Great Britain and Germany had figured this out in the 1920s because pine bark adelgid had gotten to Europe and the chemists had taken these adelgids and figured out all the aphids and all these things that glowed. So there's a paper on that. And then I'm just going to summarize and stop here, okay? So normally you don't get this, but we got amazingly effective control of hemlock woolly adelgid with one predator that turns out to be critical because it lines up with the photosynthetic activity of a hemlock. And it gives them those carbohydrates back. That's, that's the big thing there. We also know what the threshold is. If you have less than 30% of your needles infested, that tree will grow normal. Now, hedges are another subject which we can talk about in a little bit, okay? Beetles consume an average of about 97% of dense adelgid infestations, and we'll see some of that outside. Um, we've got operational levels here. Um, once again, what I would say to start with, and I'll end with a, grow, a, a slide just of a really pretty little hemlock, proper identification of the pest is number one. And although we had identified this pest as being hemlock woolly adelgid and native to Asia, we did not correctly identify this pest. It wasn't until 2006 that we actually understood, and our map of the world that I showed you from before, which was just Europe, suddenly got a lot bigger and we began to understand the, ecos the hemlock ecosystem, how this predator acts in that system, and how we can bring balance back into our watersheds because this beetle not only eats hemlock woolly adelgid, it eats pine bark adelgid, it eats balsam woolly adelgid, and it eats coolie spruce gall adelgid. So it's improving hemlock uh, growth on Hawksbill when you have Carolina hemlocks. If you go over to Roan Mountain where you're loaded up with Fraser firs, this beetle's cruising through there eating balsam woolly adelgid. Okay. So I will stop with this, but this is what I see in my woods even though I have a delta. So what I do now when I go out and if I'm gonna go out and collect and we can look at some of these bushes out here, I'm gonna look at what the crown looks like, if it has yearling growth that the adelgid can get on, and in almost every instance where you have beetles and that tree is sitting in a decent spot, it's game over. That's all you have to do. So, thank you. I'll stop. And I, do I need I to take these things? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, and this is, I guess, advanced. Uh, can they actually take a? So, when you're talking about um, hemlock woolly adelgid being native to North America, how do they figure that out? Like, can they actually grind up an adelgid and test its DNA? Yeah. And then how do they know that that's an adelgid from North America and not an adelgid from yes. Asia? Yes, they can do really crazy things like, um, I mean, this is beyond me. I had genetics in college, but this is on another level where they can even, Nathan Havel and these guys can take adelgids from here and say how long that they have been here. So he was able to time date because I think they had base samples from back at uh, Hollywood Nursery in <coughs> Richmond where the adelgid came into. We didn't even talk about that. Okay, so they are able, and especially when these things are uh, have an archaic lineage, what they were able to do is go back and show that these things are, here's another example, Carolina hemlock and Chinese hemlock are the same species. They can make a, any, here's my theory from Biology 101 and then I'll shut up on that. But if two individuals can come together and mate and they produce progeny, they're the same species. They might be a biotype. Like Rubidus is the pine bark specialist here and Nigrinus is the hemlock woolly adelgid specialist. Those two can mate. And the offspring will usually stay in hemlock. But until Laracobius nigrinus showed up, Rubidus was just off, you know, just only eating, you know, uh, it's like when uh, when some culture's food shows up in the town and you know I'm working a lumber yard and my buddy comes up to me and he goes you ever eaten Chinese food? Well that's exactly what happened is suddenly the Rubidus woke up when Nigrinus was there you know we might even find some out here but yeah that's it I don't know I don't have enough genetic background and they do something with time they can look at how these alleles change over time uh, initially yeah. the infestation was Richmond, and that was Asia. 
<coughs> yeah, even though Pacific Northwest probably hadn't built it, or yeah, hadn't built somehow it. we the introduction was Asian. Right. And so right. And then it doesn't really matter because Larry Cobius is gonna eat whatever. Yeah, they're equal, you know, they're a great government insect because it doesn't matter what race, creed, or religion or delta <laughs> they are, <laughs> they are going to eat it. Don't care whether it's Japanese or blue. Okay. Let's go outside and meet some people. Uh, yeah. All right. So what we'll do is we'll go out, and my truck's over here by the building, and I've got some. Um, we can use a beat sheet and also use a an umbrella. Uh, a couple other things, real quick. Hey, Noah, grab some coffee, water. Um, I also this this class got approved for. Um, ISA, International uh, Society of Arboriculture, is that right? Uh, the arborist certification, and we also have two hours, or, yeah, about two hours of uh, pesticide education credit. So those, those seats are up front if y'all need your CEUs. With blood, sweat, and tears. That's how this stuff comes around. I do, I mean, I don't know if everybody's out here all yet, but we can gabber a little bit, which is, to me, this is an off-site hemlock, right? It's up against a building, it's got asphalt, but the feet of it are pretty good because it's been laying down needle duff, and this tree had been treated before. It wouldn't, it wouldn't, none of this stuff around here would probably be alive if it hadn't been treated, because it, most of this is off-site, so it would have died. The other thing we'll do is we'll go over to that corner over there where they cut off the tops of those hemlocks where the power line is, and we'll go look at those because you're, you're going to find, you should find beetles and larvae in all these places. Now, I can use a white regular regulation beet sheet, but because we want to see, I want to show you guys larvae, we'll just pop this thing open. And now we got a colored background. And So I did this with Jim and Blake out at um, Miller Farm Supply. So now they all wanted t-shirts, so I had to give everybody Miller Farm Supply. Okay, let's take a look and see what we got. All right. Okay. We have, let's see if we got some larva. It may take a beat or two. Everything doesn't perform all the time. Um, there's larva in here. Let me do one other thing real quick. Let's see. Let's hit this one. Alright. Nothing up my sleeve. Alright. So we've got a few beetles in here. I saw some. Here's a beetle right there. 
All right, look at the beetle so that your t-shirt is valid. <laughs> Otherwise, it will shock you. It's set up, okay? So, here we are. The nearest beetles that were put out here, I actually put beetles out over at Mary Gray's many years ago and told her not to cut her heads, but of course, if they put beetles out, they cut their heads, but the beetles had reproduced. They're all over the place here. There's, there's larvae in here too, we're gonna find. There's little tiny beetles in here called skim millis. They're little tiny, elongate hemlock scale predators. And so that's something that we'll talk about too, is if you look at this, this is actually pretty healthy because if I look at the crown of this thing, look how healthy it is and look at the size of the leaders that are going off of it. And in what I call my Christmas tree terminology, that's triple flush because it sent it out and then it grew laterals and then those laterals flush too. It isn't just a leader, you know what I mean? It isn't just a straight little skinny leader coming out, okay? So what I would do, of course, this is, you guys, this is my life, right? Here it is, right here, right? <laughs> so I'm sucking these things up. There's one there. Um, we'll, we'll also see some uh, larvae in here, and there's larvae we can take and just clip samples. Um, you'll get a few, there's another beetle. You'll get a few, um, there's some fungus gnats in there, and that would be natural because conifers are fungal based. Um, you will find some larvae in here too. The, they're just now starting to send out larvae. And I've got that beetle here. So if we need to take it inside and uh, I think that's a larva right there. So the larvae are white. That's why I'm using this beet sheet like this. And this is why the Forest Service people missed it. They were using a white beet sheet. Ah. So. I stood up to Mark Mayer and I said, if you were working for me, I'd fire you right now. But he, he's a good buddy of mine that I had known for 20 years, so I could chuck and jive him. So all of us, and so here's another little trick that you can do. You can float this. Now that everything's in there, I can lift this up and let everything else float out like that. Don't let it slide, you know what I mean? I did a really good uh, J motion, shall we say. And then you go like this. And everything down here are beetles. I mean, there there will be beetles and larvae in there. Okay. So there are little there are little tiny larvae in here. Um, let's go to another spot. Or hit, I'll let somebody now. The one thing about using this color, your after image with purple is not real good. You know what I mean? But so so we can go along here just like this. Um, usually on a yeah yeah. Usually on a, a, a head like this, as I would get out my uh, beat sheet because I can jam that thing in, right? But if I just go here like this, go like this, get here, and I can come up here. So this would be a sunny day in Seattle, by the way. You would be working on a day like Here's larva right there. See that larva? That's about a half-grown larva, so that thing's probably eating about 150 eggs. This is what I love. I love to see those things. Man. I wonder if, do they scream when you eat them? <laughs> right? Is it like an alien movie? Right? So, here's your, these are your little baby. These guys, by the way, they glow green under ultraviolet light. So, some of the crazy stuff that we'll do here in a minute is we'll uh, take some samples back in and for those of you that had a dorm room in the 70s you don't need to see this but people that didn't have a dorm room in the 70s where we had all the black lights and all that stuff so this is a really quick way if if this was a hedge next to a house what i would tell somebody is you keep your drip line if you have to, if, if you don't have needle duff, you can go buy pine straw and put down an inch or two of pine straw and you can make immediate needle duff. So if you look at these trees over here, right, they are, the one next to the road is off-site and stressed, but we could probably find a delta on it. The one up further up is in better shape and it's been treated and there's hardly any delta on it. But if we get over, we can just we'll walk up to the corner up there and see these other trees because those are in more of a, a natural habitat even though the tops of them got cut off. So if I'm in Seattle and I'm getting paid by the bug, I am looking to find 
trees like that. I'm looking to find trees like this up next to a building. Uh, in Seattle, I go to a lot of cemeteries because these big old cemeteries all have hemlocks in them. And the state tree of Washington is western hemlock, so every one of your state buildings like this would have western hemlocks around. So I don't really have a problem. The problem I have is every year this crazy thing's in patch dynamics where this year it would be like this, next year I come back here and there's nothing. Because the beetles had just wiped it out. Now they may be over there, you know what I mean? It just moves around in the valley. Boop, 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 boop. So the adelgid gets what it needs, the beetle gets what it needs, and these trees are really nice and they're actually healthier than trees that don't have adelgids and beetles, okay? So, um, that's, um, that's about it on this end from here. So we can just go, if you guys want to, let's go, um, yeah, let's go up over here. We'll, let's just look at an off-site tree and then we'll look at kind of a semi-on-site tree. And then we'll take some samples back in and look under ultraviolet. So sometimes you'll have physical damage or if you have a gravel road or a dusty road and you have hemlocks near there, they're not going to have a delgid on them just because it's like insecticidal, you know, it's like dust, it's like diatomaceous earth. You just got dust all over them. You won't get, you, you, you don't get many. Now as you get on the back side of this where it's healthier and probably here too, if you trim limbs off any time before now, you're hurting the tree because this tree's still getting photosynthesis. You want to wait till they just start to sprout out and then you can trim them because then they can make up for them. But if you trim them in the fall and the winter, you're getting rid of all the photosynthate that they would have been using. That's why you can look at like that hedge behind Hampton Funeral Home and it looks horrible because they just cut the top off of it at the wrong time of year. We're going to have a funeral for that hedge pretty soon. <laughs> Let's we'll see if we can get some here and then we'll go up. So all you got to do here is hit this. This one's much sparser. You can't see as many adelgids in there, but I'm pretty sure we're going to find stuff. Just have to look around. This one's pretty sparse. And this is what happens too. I mean, a lot of times you hit, you may not get something. You can come back and hit the same thing two hours later and you'll get something. So we've got the little skim nilis. I'm gonna float this and then we'll see if we got any larva. Here we go, that's all I gotta do. And now I can look, cause the larva will hold on. There's larva right there. That's a different one from the one of earlier, yeah. <laughs> so that's, those are your, that's your larva. Here's another one. No, not sure. No. Anyway, they're, they're all different sizes. There's not a lot of big ones yet because it's still early. The peak of egg laying is when red buds bloom. So down off the mountain right now, that's peak. Uh, I, um, one of the people that is one of my customers is Tim Sweeney, who owns 52,000 acres of hemlocks. He owns the escarpment, and I'm his man. He likes those t-shirts. So it's, it's really nice to be able to have somebody like that that finally came along. So we've got, we've got, now see, he, okay, he's got, this is, this is what we would normally use. If you use this and you don't know what larva look like, how are you going to see a white larva on a white sheet? You can, right? But but the nice thing with this type of thing is I can jam it in there like this and pound like that. Okay. And 
set it out. So this would be really good if I was just collecting adults from like October until um, the end of March, let's say. And then from here on out, what's going to happen, I can float it like this, and if there's anybody holding on, here's a, here's a fungus gnat. Um, there's probably some larvae in here if I look real close. That's a calembolin. You get you get all those little ground. Everything that occurs in the ground around these trees is in these trees. Yeah, that might be a little larva. So let's go up. We'll just go up to the corner up here, and we'll hit one more spot, and then we'll come back and do some uh, scoping. This tree up here looks real good, but it's been treated and it has almost no adelgid. Probably temperature and photo So this beetle, this beetle can reproduce on hemlock woolly adelgid and it can reproduce on pine bark adelgid. It feeds on coolie spruce gall adelgid and it feeds on balsam woolly adelgid and I don't know if it reproduces on them. I, we've never done the studies to show that. Okay. So let's use, yeah, let's use that guy. All right, now here's the other thing that I do sometimes. I get those umbrellas that have a, a post on them here. So I can hold them up. So what we'll do here, I'll just get some of these. These trees, of course, are in they're in outbreak almost all the time. There's pretty heavy adelgid on them. And what, what I can do here is do this. And then come up. I want to hit this limb right here that's just loaded with adelgid. Here's a beetle right there. Sorry, I gotta look real close. Okay. Yeah, look real close. <laughs> Qual get, make sure your t-shirt qualifies. There's another beetle. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. James Hi. And let me tell you, normally when you do this, you know what I mean? I can't find a bug on demand. You tell me go out and find yeah. a roly poly right now. <laughs> I bet you could do it. Oh yeah, I could. But but this is hard. Here's a okay. No, that was a, I thought it was, there's larva landed there. Can that's them right there? Yeah. Yeah. There here, I'll is. put one in here. So remember, if you hey, see me in the man. park, you guys, I'm just sucking hey, bugs. Man, what are you doing? <laughs> hey, dude. hey dude. It's Friday, man. <laughs> I'm out west. I thought I was in Seattle. I forgot. <laughs> so yeah. It's okay. There, there's a larva. Another little one. We got. So you're gonna. We'll, yeah, we'll just carry some of these back. Yeah, you probably got one there. Let's carry. We'll just carry this one back because we've got larva here. There's a larva here. You have to hit pretty hard to knock the larva off because the larva are inside those ovus. You know what I mean? You really gotta, gotta pound. So we'll carry this back. We've got two adults. We've got larva. We'll see the glow show. It's only Tuesday. Oh, the other thing I got to tell you guys, every hotel room is a crime scene. <laughs> oh, <I know. laughs> oh my goodness. I had the distinct pleasure of sitting next to a detective at a wedding recently, right? And I turned to this guy and everybody else just moved away from us because all we were doing was talking about what glowed what color, right? <laughs> And I know too much. We're not gonna. That's for another. We need we need certification hours to talk about that. We can justify that. 
Oh yeah, you ought to see the stuff that goes on in my Christmas tree patch. You hey, wouldn't believe it. Is this a, what is that? Is that a, this is a Laracobius beer right here. That's a girl, yeah. Oh, wow. That. Did you find one? Oh yeah. yeah oh, we got two. We got larva. Two. I got larva. I'm gonna bring it. Yeah, here. Bring it back. Put it here. Can you make it bigger with that thing right there? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just sucked it up, yeah. man. As he just sucked it up. Yeah. Oh, it tastes good. That's not a larva, is it? Is that uh, just a... That's just a... It looks like a oh, ball, but I got... We got larva here, larva there. Oh, there you go. We got larva on the other side. We were flinging them away, and we should have just been putting them in a thing, but we... Here's one there. So, we're about... We're about halfway through egg laying. They usually start about late January, but this year everything was late. Like I could go by the wood frogs. When the wood frogs was in my pond was after Valentine's Day. So that's a colder season because normally around here it's usually by the end of January it has one. Okay. So, so we've got it all. It's all right here. Let's check it out. Let's go look at it. You're right. Yeah, you got your hours. Get the heck out of here. <laughs> you missed the bus. <laughs> I tell you what, I turned on to 421 and it was backed up all the way to Boone. You know what I mean? I'm like, this is the morning rush hour that I'm not. Oh, the bridge messes us up trying to get over here. 421 to two lanes, nasty. Okay, this got stuck where we were, right? thing that I can tell you right here was we have beetles just dripping from you know I mean we look how we're 10 feet from the back door and we're getting beetles so and there are tons up in these hedges around here awesome. so this is how change happens right it's if it happening. has to crawl in your ear it can do it you know <laughs> that's what we need working with nature right? exactly right and being and you have to be in you have to ask a 20-year question right in our field what's 20 years to a tree right. and we're, we have such fleeting lifetimes oh yeah that's why this work is so monumental because then it can be built on it yeah exactly i'll stay i'll be the greeter that's right uv is groovy uv is groovy uv is groovy and that's not University of Virginia, because I'm a Hokie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Let's get, I'll pull so right out. Put this one on. Yes! <laughs> this one on the mic, too. I'm just going to see it. I got it. All right, Nancy, can you doubt it now? Can we come to the right hand side? Just, okay. Oh, you're finishing up things?
you want to move it down here and plug it in directly? Uh, Do you have one? Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Oh, wait, it's not plugged in. Well, now it's plugged in. Oh, did it pop it? Well, here, let's do this. Let's take this one out. We know the top one works. Yeah, there we go. It just went plugged in. Thanks. Oh, and our needle left. Yeah, here he is. I'll get him. He's in, he's in right there. Oh. I'm just going to put him back in the factory okay. until we need him. Come here, you. Yeah, here. there he is. came out and something from the rear of the one on top <laughs> the rear of the one on the bottom. <laughs> well, that's another sign that I know that they like where they are, right? You know? I mean, we used to do that with ladybugs. We'd put them out, you know, and we'd spray out sugar water. And people say, well, how do you know if they like where they are? And I would just say, well, I'm, I don't, here's a slide. You know, they, they're willing to invest their resources now. And we could put this, um, she's got a handheld scope, so we'll show what those larvae look like too, because they look, they look a lot like ladybug larvae, or like a little alligator, got, or like the Michelin yeah. man, they got all these rings on them. Can you see them? Oh yeah, I do. Yeah, here, we'll move around. Not on So now if they poop in there, it glows bright orange under it all the time. <laughs> oh yeah, there we go. Let's do the, let's get a larva right here. Let me see. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I've got the black, I've got some black paper here. That's an oversack with eggs, okay. There's a lot of them. There's several of them here. That's one. Yeah, that's one. There's a larva. My gosh. All right, look at that thing. Oh, oh yeah. it just ate a crawler. Oh, yeah. <laughs> ah, he's taking it with him. Oh, no. He probably already ate it. We, we could have seen that beautiful act of violence. <laughs> what is that, Dave? That's a Larry larva. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's what, that's what we want to see. Okay. Now, okay, so we've got that. We've seen the adults. You've seen the larva. And then what we can do, too, is... Um, well, if you've got that branch, we can show under that scope uh, maybe the ultraviolet. Yeah. Here you go. Watch this. Light this up. Can you turn that light off? Does the light go off? Probably, but I've never tried. Hmm. Settings. Dang. If not, I think we can overpower it with this. Is that the light up there? Yes. There we go. Damn. Now, all right, you guys are looking at yeah, this is um, this is predator poop going ultraviolet under under this scope. Okay, so one of the things that we can do, 
Right. You know, this is powerful enough too. Let me do, I'll, I'll do one other thing too. Um, we, I can just walk around and show you. See that bright orange right there? Oh yeah, yeah. That's what you're looking for. There it is, stings the eyeball. Oh yeah, this thing will, you really, yeah. Normally, yeah, this is a one watt detective ultraviolet flashlight. Here, let me show you. This, this is the live shot. My eyes went cross. This is the live shot. Oh, okay. okay. Right there. So if you look right in that one spot, it's real bright orange, and that's that's just all predator poop. If you've tagged a deer and it's still walking, you can use ultraviolet light and go find a find a blood trail. So you have, you actually have four different colors here. You have orange, yellow is a damaged egg. You have that chartreuse color that we showed earlier, and then blue. So you have, it looks like a Christmas tree lit up. It's very, very neat to see the whole thing. Um, so what we can do, um, I can just show you real quick. See that, see that? Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Big time. Oh go. yeah, big time. Yeah. And then see the blue, those are intact ovisacs, so it's kind of jewel-like, yeah, you know, yeah. real liquidy looking. Come on, Cheryl. Can you get this off? Must be be in there. Shoot, you know, shoot, you know, shoot, you know shoot, it's good for you. Huh? Okay, so that one was damaged earlier. There's, there's wow. some, crunchy. there's some. Yeah. 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 That's what you get. Yeah. Yeah. There's crunchy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This time of year. Now later on in the season, you'll get harmonia ladybugs and surfers and all these other things that'll come out. Outside today. So you can find them real quick. If you had them, you could spray with BT. You know what I mean? <coughs> Cure caterpillars. That's what you needed to do. So it's a really cool way to. And that's in here too, by the way. That's on the back page. Like you know, this stuff. Right? The orange really glows. Yeah, it's that's the one I want to see first. It's gonna show up here. This is a crime scene. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And boy, can they tell a lot. Well, you could do that. I mean, the thing that we could do, <coughs> the other thing that I have. So why don't you lay that light down here and then you forget about it and then I take that home with Well, you know, I, I already did that at Extension. Extension has one. Paige has one. Would that one work from Amazon? You get three ninety five. You want to get an arm, and so it it does ultraviolet all the way around. And I can lay my camera in there and let it take a time because it's crazy to try to take a picture of this stuff. You know, it shows up gray or something. You know what I mean? And I'm like, I have to do time lapse. But you can see that it works. All right. Are there any other questions? We're moving on. 
Right, so um, for, just for a little, little context, and we, I, I didn't really speak about this earlier. So I, I came in as a, primarily as the Christmas tree agent in, uh, in, in 2002. And, I, you know, I, I was doing work with the Christmas tree industry. And then we started getting these calls from homeowners, Extension did. Uh, uh, Avery County started getting them, Ash County started getting them. Hey, our, tree, our hemlocks are falling out, our hemlocks are dying, what's going on? The landscapers, like, you know, uh, Lear and David and others were saying, hey, this, this thing, this, uh, this hemlock woolly adelgid is a serious, serious problem. Um, we were getting, you know, 10 to 20 calls per week. I know the landscapers were getting that level of calls. And it was really just a, it was a, it was a scramble to determine what was the, you know, how, how to treat this thing. And, and, and at first, uh, you know, there are the individual agents in each of the counties were trying to glean all this information and take all the, you know, everything that was coming out on this pest. Hey, does this work? What about a soil drench? What about these, this capsule injection where you actually inject, you know, with a hydraulic, uh, you know, pump into the cambium of the tree? What about just spraying? What about trying oil? Okay, maybe we can do that. Well, is it better to do it in the spring? It's the better, okay, what's the life cycle of this thing? So we had all this information that was sort of coming together in the, in the early to mid 2000s uh, while uh, Dr. McDonald and other entomologists were really researching and looking into, into the predators. But for, for our perspective, from Extension's perspective, you know, we get more calls from the landowners, from the farmers, hey, how can I treat this thing? Hey, do I have this on, can you come out and see how my trees are doing? And so, you know, over the years in the mid 2000s, early into the 20, 2010s, you know, Dick and some of the other landscapers were saying, hey, we're starting to see this, this predator beetle now, all right? Uh, and then Dick would say, the predator beetle's everywhere. A couple years ago, you'll find it everywhere. And I was like, well, that's great. I mean, it's not that I didn't trust you, but as a research-based organization, we have to provide, you know, we, we, we wanted to, to introduce, you know, Hedjik. And we talked about it for a while, and he's like, well, let's show off some of the GIS skills you have and things of that nature. Um, and we still kicked around ideas and stuff. And then, you know, Paige actually suggested, hey, let's see if we can get him to work with Laracobius. And I was like, what's Laracobius? <laughs> um, I think this um, be able to go from there. And so in researching and all this kind of stuff, I came across a study done in 2012 with Virginia Tech that basically said, hey, you know, um, Laracobius nigrinus's rate of spread should be about 39 meters a year or 400 meters after five years, you know. So there's a little bit of vari variability in there. And I was like, well, that's something great. We can take all these release data information and, you know, I can create buffers and we can kind of see where the ideal spread of this thing. Okay, so, um, you know, Dr. McGon 10 here in the high country and you know, we were specifically just looking at Watauga County. Um, and so, I'll kind of step up here real fast. But of course, this is Watauga County and these blue dots all around are um, Dick's release sites. And so there's a lot of release sites um, throughout the county. And um, then what we were able to do with that is go create buffers on the rate of spread according to the Virginia Tech study. And so initially when me and Jim were looking at this map here, we were kind of like, okay, um, that's not very big. Um, because, you know, ideally, according to all the book work, you know, we shouldn't be seeing Laracobius in any of these spots. And so from that kind of data, we were able to sit there and say, well, you know, any kind of sampling and survey that we do um, is going to be a great show, it's going to show presence um, in a really good manner. So what we decided to do was just convenient sampling. Um, and we sent out a survey to the community to kind of get permission from private landowners and things of that nature. So we could also check woodlots that those beetles were probably coming from, from those release sites. And so that's what this looks like. Um, we got our connecting um, and then our straight line distance divided by that number gives us a rate of spread. And so we were able to do that for each individual point. And so when I saw that number, I was like, well, what, what's the furthest point we had? What's the extreme of that? 
So the furthest point we got from a release location was 10,250 meters away. And once you do the average, once you do the rate of spread of that, and, you know, it, it makes a whole lot more sense to use these beetles for large tracts of lands, is what we found from the data. Um, but of course, you know, there's always a caveat to that. Um, while, you know, it's a predator beetle, and in order to have a predator beetle, you have to have that's food source. You can't have one and not the other. So, of course, the hemlocks you're going to see um, with Laracobius are still going to show signs of infection. Um, and signs of infection are also going to include some damage and residues. Um, Locks on your property and don't mind us coming out and looking, you know, please let us know. So we went out to this property in the middle of Bethel. There weren't, there, there, it wasn't like a hemlock for, forest. Mm -hmm. There were just some isolated individual hemlocks on this property. And the guy said, yeah, be careful. It's hunting season. Don't walk off the trail. You know, you know. so we walk up just to this one isolated tree, nothing around it except set beaches. How many extension as the extension office, if we're not finding them, you know, when clients call, we really can't say, well, there's no, you know, for, don't worry about your forest hemlocks. But, but, you know, now we can, I feel very confident in saying that. Um, so I, 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 at this point, um, I'd like to get a, a yes. Um, did you did you stop at the uh, the border? Did, or I know you've got one place where they released looks like ash. Did you go into ash at all, or or Avery, or do, was I the mean, scope just to be Watauga? Because it looks like they could easily be. Um, I mean, I I treated individual trees for people. I treated hedges. I worked with country clubs. I had a team of uh, guys at Hound Deer's Club. We went through the woods. We treated trees, um, and it, you know we had like on some of these bigger properties. We had like um, we even had m some of the membership would be like, okay, you're in charge of this quadrant, and the people got really involved in it, you know, and and doing it. So we really knocked it back really hard, um, and. For instance, at Elk River Club, I treated a lot of, there's a lot of big hemlocks along the, the main road going into the club, to the clubhouse. And we went in there and we, we did soil injections into these trees one time. And that was, I don't know how many years ago, eight, ten years ago. And we haven't done anything since. Well, there was Laracobius release near there. And we haven't taken a real close look, but I probably will tomorrow because I'm going up there tomorrow. Um, but these trees from a distance and from the car, which is the main thing, they look beautiful. They're green, they're big, they're, they don't even look like they were hurt. So part of what happened, you know, like with treating a lot of these trees in the early 2000s with the chemistry, um, they didn't really get hurt. By the adelgid. Um, so it's kind of, I, I kind of look at it like human health. You know, if you, you know, if you got a clogged artery and they go in there and they fix it before you have a heart attack, your, your heart's still going to be pretty good and vigorous. If you have a heart attack and then they fix you, then you might not be as vigorous. Well, a lot of these early treated trees, they still maintain their vigor and their density. And a lot of them have only been treated like one time, maybe twice over almost what, almost 20 years now. Yeah. Um, so this imidacloprid has this ability to last a long time. And they can prove that it stays with the tree for years and years and all that. Um, but the idea was, you know, we're gonna treat trees with chemicals until the scientists can help us figure out how to, if, we can treat this biologically. And now, so now we're in a different place. Because Dick and I went meetings, he would be on that end of the room and I'd be on that end of the room. And then slowly we've migrated together and this thing that we like, you know, that we like to call IPM, right? Integrated Pest Management. So to kind of bring it all together for me, I deal with homeowners that, um, you know, if you see a Delgid, that, that's this was our thing, you know. If you see any of that white adelgid, call me, you know, because we're gonna treat it, spray it, and this and that. Well, now 
we have a different story to tell people. If you see a Delgid, well, you're probably going to have some predator in there. So don't get so alarmed, right? We're not going to pull the chemicals out yet. But I have clients who have, an, you know, on Main Street in Blowing Rock, I have a client who has a hedge, and it's a 100-year-old hedge, and it hangs over the walkway going into town. It's up towards where the old hospital used to be. And, you know, when you deal with individual clients, you kind of get an idea of what their tolerance or what their desire is. And so, you know, these people have zero tolerance for a Delgid. They don't want a Delgid in their hedge. I don't let a Delgid get in their hedge. I mean, they spend thousands of dollars annually to trim this hedge, keep this hedge healthy. I do tissue samples, I do soil samples, I do, you know, it, they're at the top of my, my chart, right? Um, and then, you know, other people have more informal properties and they might have a few hemlocks that are nice in their yard and then they have hemlocks that go beyond. And so now my personal sort of theory with those type of clients is you know, that we treat the trees that are right around the house, hedge, you know, ornamentals, hedges, um, big forest type trees that might have had some compaction or um, some construction issues when the house was built, you know. But those trees, you know, and, and they want to, when they pull into their property, they want to see beautiful big green, you know, trees. Um, and so, you know, what we've done is we've quit treating further away from the house. You know, the further away from the house, the less treating we're doing. But right there, the stuff that's right in your face, I still treat and I still feel like it's a good idea to treat because, you know, in the landscape, uh, Larry Cobius, like for my hedge on Blowing Rock, it's never gonna give them that, as we say in the, uh, in the business, that clean look that, chemicals will do um, and we need these things to kind of have this kind of unnatural clean <laughs> look that uh, that as Dick was saying off-site these are off-site areas where we planted hemlock which is a tree that people try to convince to be a shrub a lot right and I have to have that conversation with people because they're you know they when a hedge is a hundred years old and they've been trimming it and trimming it every year and not letting it grow and it doesn't get to photosynthesize or anything. I mean, after a hundred years, you know, I'll go look at a hedge and they're like, well, what's wrong with that one? And there's like a big hedge row. And I'm like, wow, you know, you've been trimming this thing for, you know, 60 years. And you know, there's a, there's a branch that's that long. And maybe the hedge is only about, you know, that really the branches are about that long. Well, if that tree was growing out in the forest, it would probably be an 80 foot tree you know, with 30 foot branches. And so, you know, as a human, we're, be, you know, we, we like to trim them down and make them. And that is a very challenging part of managing hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, you know, with the more natural, and I, and I don't, I try not to pay a lot of attention to the ornamental stuff because to me, the big forest trees are the important part of this because that's where they rely on other animals and insects to live. Um, amongst the hemlocks and the trout and, um, and all that. But, you know, there's times, and they haven't had one in a while, but I have to say, one of the, one of the best rewarding times that, I, that uh, Dr. McDonald and I connected, they, they do a three-day symposium on hemlock woolly adelgid, the forestry department does. And you get to sit and hear all kinds of different studies that go on you know, how chemistry works, how bio biologicals are working. And the last time we had one in Asheville, Dick got up to give his talk about Larry Cobius, and they had known about Larry Cobius, but the government hadn't really focused on it. But he'd been focusing on it. <laughs> and their predator, which we pretty much deem as unsuccessful now, and most um, most people who are objective would, you know, and really look at the science would probably agree. But the, but the government still sort of stands behind Sagiskimness because they put a lot into it and they have to. 
Um, but anyhow, Dick got up and got to give his talk about Laracobius, and it, and, and it was it was very uh, rewarding for me sitting in the back because it was sort of a an aha moment, and a lot of those researchers knew he was right, but they couldn't get up and say much because of the people that signed their check, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so there's Dick up there, and they're like, ah, there's that McDonald again, causing problems. But ultimately, he was right. And as an entomologist, you know, entomology is a fairly boring, I think, as a, <laughs> you know, it's a lot of, it's a lot of this, you know, it's a lot of time in the lab and this and that. But, but to be able to get involved in something, you know, he's been involved in a lot of things, but to be able to get involved in something like this and really come up with what is an answer and a success, because when you look on the internet now, I mean, major players are involved in this. So I sent Dick an article. Um, there's this place in Rocky Gap where near in Western Maryland where my aunt lives, and that's been a big release site. And recently they went in there and they collected Laracobius out of Rocky Gap Park and they moved them to a site in Pennsylvania where there's a lot of mature hemlocks where one of the planes that went down that was shot down in 9-11, it's a memorial site. And so that shows you that the government is engaging in this and they're behind it. But they're not going to get up and say, oh, Dick McDonald's the greatest guy ever. That, that would be against their morals because they have their other guys. Uh, yes? Um, so how does the, the, do the pesticides and the good beetles work? Do they kill them too or how yes. do they work together? They probably will. They probably okay. would. And so the idea is if you have trees that you're treating chemically, you kind of keep them on, as we like to say, the, uh, the treadmill. You just keep them, as we say, clean. You don't ever let a delgy get into those trees. You keep them sprayed, you keep them, and like I said, this imidacloprid will last for years, so every five or six or seven years, if you hit them with a little imidacloprid, then the, the predator's not gonna be attracted to a tree that doesn't have food. So, and, and there's other ways of managing, like Laracobius, and this is where I have to rely on Dick. In the summertime, Laracobius, okay, Normally it's not there, but what we're finding now that we're getting them more and more, it's looking like it does in Seattle where they're out all year long. But typically, typically they're not there. They're in the soil. Right. In, in, 20, in 2010, a, another for, a former student of mine was doing an internship or something with the Forest Service out of Asheville, and, and they were, it was a summer survey, and they put these collection funnels around the bases of a number of different trees in Valley Cruces Park where the beetles had been. By Really, Bud, may, yep, he was Bud's yeah. in, intern. So I would go out, you know, former student invites me. It was like, hey, I'm sampling for this beetle. So he had left these traps out. We would go, huh, nothing, huh, nothing, huh, nothing. All summer long, he came back, I don't know, eight different times during the summer and was not finding beetles. So I think that sort of data collection during the wrong time of the year, you know, as researchers, they, you know, they, they, yeah, it's not that they have blinders on, they're going by the data. Right. There, was, there were no beetles collected, so XXX, Laracobius isn't working right. until later. Right, because it's a fall, winter, yep. active, adelgids. This is all active fall, mm -hmm. mostly active fall, winter, spring. Right. And, but anyhow, I was saying, like, so if you have hedge that you want to spray, you know, um, you're probably better off to do it in the summer and do you something like soap or something that's not, that doesn't have a, a residual, like a lot of this chemi chemistry lingers on the foliage, these systemics especially. Um, so you could go in there and use something like oil or soap. But you know, the bad thing to me about oil or soap is it is a non-discriminatory, like it'll kill a lot of stuff. You know, um, a lot of these insecticides are, it's like chemo, it, well it is chemotherapy, right, for the tree. But they're, just like with people, tree chemistry and agricultural chemicals are becoming more targeted. Um, and there's things like uh, insect growth regulators that are very soft on predators. So there's a really, it's hard to give a general answer, but I do think you could integrate some, you know, sort of common sense practice into doing treatments. 
And that's kind of what we do with integrated pest management. Um, a product like Safari, which is a, another neonicotinoid, it's very short-lived in the tree. So you could use something like Safari to have a less of a lingering effect. Um, and you can spray it on the bark instead of putting it in the soil. And there's all this sort of science that evolves with it. And, you know, I like trees and I like science. I like the science of the chemistry and I like the science of the, of the biology with the pests. So, um, you know, over time, you know, what has proven to us just, you know, is that um, going out with Dick and now going out by myself, you know, I carry my little beach sheet with me all the time now. And I do find Laracobius everywhere. So I have to say to my customer, all right, customer, you know, we treated these trees with chemicals 10 years ago. Now I'm back to talk to you about it again. Boom, boom, boom. Here's some predators. What do you think we should do? Some of my clients, I don't even bring it up because I just know they don't want that story. I'm like, <laughs> they, just, they want the trees to be chemically treated. Um, but most people, I will open that story, and then I wind, then I really confuse them, and they're like, "Oh, I don't know what to do. <laughs> should I not treat the trees or treat the trees?" Should and then I, I can, or should I? Go? Yeah, and then I can get involved and say, "Well, I think we should maybe treat these, and let's leave these alone." And it is a good idea if you want to kind of have your cake and eat it too, um, to treat some that are really important to you, that you just can't afford to you lose, because it's a short-term treatment relative to the, you know, our life and everything. So eventually it's gonna wear off and I'll die, they'll die, and you know, maybe Larry Cobius will be really built up by then and it'll come back in. So if it satisfies you to, to, to go ahead and treat some, then, you know, I, I don't have a problem with it. Of course, I've made a major part of my living treating trees, which, Am I done? No, no. You're getting, you're uh, <laughs> you know, and and so we, but but so Dick, you know, this it's very exciting, and you know, like I said, the scientists, the entomology schools, the forestry schools, ISA, people are really looking at us here because this is where it sort of started, and it's mostly because Dick lives here, um, and we had the ability to use Grandfather Mountain Country Club's uh, resources, money, right? Uh, and the, all these clubs, you know, that have invested money in them because Hound Ears has put a lot of money in, Jan Lassi, um, Grandfather, I mean, all up and down 105, there's been a lot of uh, chemical and biological, you know, treatments. But then people will say to me, well, should I buy some of these beetles? And the answer is yes and no, because it's like if kind of like if you you know build it, they will come. Because when we go around, and we start looking and we find them. Well, they're there, you know. And if you want to spend some money and try to purchase a few, which he pretty much has a corner on the market, um, you can't really buy these commercially yet. Um, very difficult to rear this in a lab, um, but. You know they are coming in and if you want to try to buy some and put them in you know that's only going to make it better for you so um, you know and the story goes on and on and on like I said they do a three-day symposium because you know the hope is that you can add maybe a summer predator to this which there's work with that and we've worked with a bunch and um, and that you'll have two or three different good bugs eating the bad bugs um, which brings me to, so we've, we've been talking about hemlock for years, and now what I talk about a lot with people is emerald ash borer. And that, that's not on the agenda, but I gotta sneak it in. <laughs> emerald ash borer, right? So we're under siege right now, emerald ash borer. Yeah. Um, and uh, there is a predator of emerald ash borer. Um, emerald ash borer is not it, it is chemically treatable, but um, ash is not a major component of our forest, and it's not a tree that we really plant as an ornamental. They do in other parts of the world, or, or the United States. It's a big street tree. Um, 
But emerald ash borer is a non-native insect, which is sort of what we thought hemlock woolly does. It is, you know, it comes in and it exclusively feeds on ash, and it is a killer. And you'll start seeing ash dying. They're dying now. Um, but if you know of any ash trees that are what you know what I would describe as a um, a specimen, or you know, when I talk to people about trees in their yard. I, my, one of the first things I'll say is, you know, well, it's a hemlock or whatever. I'll say, is this tree adding value to your property or your life somehow? And if they say yes, then we talk about this direction. If they say no, we talk about it in another direction. Because if it's not a really a valuable tree to you, then a chainsaw is a great cure for all these non-native pests. You know, no hemlock, no adelgid, no problem. Um, no ash, you know, no ash borer. So tree really has to be adding value to your property and, and to you um, to do a treatment. But this is a treatable condition, emerald ash borer, and it takes, you know, an in a direct injection of insecticide. Um, but more over the next probably five years, we'll start seeing a lot more ash trees yeah. um, dying, unfortunately. And then there's other I saw my first, uh, it, actually Jerry uh, in the back showed me my first emerald ash borer. There were a, uh, ash trees around the softball field there in, in yeah. Newland. Yeah. I popped the, the bark off and there's the, and there's the yeah. crawler, there's the larvae. They're now, they've now been removed. It took, it took me five years yeah. to, to cut it down. And yeah. finally cut it down, they were all, now they're all dead and they spread, up. they spread the emerald ash borer really well. <laughs> uh, so they cut them down and then they finally they burned them. So. Yeah. That's an example of the government going from complete quarantine, we can keep it out, to sorry about your luck. Yeah, well yeah, a lot of ash wood, so you carry the firewood, you know, your tree dies, you cut it up, then you take your firewood from uh, somewhere around in Illinois to the race, NASCAR race in Bristol, <laughs> and uh, the APHIS guys are walking around you know, I think those are the guys that like carry guns. And they're like, where'd, where'd this firewood come from? <laughs> you know, so there's a big campaign about not moving firewood. Guys, so from all of what you are saying, we have emerald ash. I have lots of hemlocks on our property, and there's a lot of, you know, the bad stuff. Yeah. So when they're dead, we're supposed to cut them down and burn them? Because I've got all lots, the, of, lots of... All the emerald ash... Yes, because the yeah. emerald ash borer can survive. But stuff in pine beetle, you can cut down the tree and the, and the beetles get mixed up, couldn't get out of the tree. They've actually chipped ash trees and the beetles continue their life cycle and came out of adults. So with emerald ash borer, you've got to burn it because the beetles will find a way. Okay. And if you want to know if you have it, you just go outside in June wear, wearing a purple shirt and if you have emerald ash borer, it'll light right on you. Oh. But then the hemlock, Perfect. though, with all my woolly delgies, I just leave it and yeah. leave it. Well, and the main, the main reason that... Because that, that it's food. For, for a lot of the treat, the for some treatments, you know, the Park Service and the U.S. Forest Service, you know, they were they were as concerned about hemlock, woolly delgies, but, they, you know, in some of these campgrounds, uh, you know, Big River down at, uh, at, at Catalucci, their campgrounds were underneath three to four to 600-year-old hemlocks, that were starting to die. So the liability for them, you know, I, when the top of a 600 or 400 year old, you know, hemlock breaks off and smashes, you know, eight cars in the parking lot, they, it, 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 it was sort of a, you know, they prioritize those key trees. But I don't think they burned any hemlocks because of Adelgid. It's more, but with, with the ash borer for sure. And now, we treated ash trees at Grandfather Mountain State Park, and there's some treated at, um, Mount Jefferson State Park, and about every three years you need to retreat them till this big wave of borer sort of passes through and runs out of food. Basically, we're protecting individuals, um, and right now we're trying to come up with the money, which is hard to do with the state, to retreat them. But once you initiate treatment on an ash tree, you've kind of committed to this 10-year treatment cycle to protect the tree. But then you can kind of back off of treatments as this borer moves on 
in this progressive front. So these, you know, all these tree pests and pests in general, they operate in different ways. So, and how we react to them, you know, is different. So, are there any like funds available because you know selling trees is very expensive to make yeah. it. Yeah. Do with that or anything like that? Or is it all just on the private? Probably don't. Or um, any donor. You know, I don't know. Probably not. I know if you them. if you cut your Bradford pears down, they'll give you another tree. Yeah, there's a big campaign against Bradford pear right now. Yeah. That's another story. That's another, yeah. Um, and then, you know, and one thing that we didn't talk about, but we're getting ready to talk about with Jerry, is, okay, we're adelgid, 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 but what about elongated hemlock scale that gets on hemlock and can really make them look really bad? Not typically a killer, but it makes them look bad. Um, and we do have... Uh, problems with that and especially in the Christmas tree industry this elongated hemlock scale loves Fraser fir Christmas trees and it's a very difficult pest to control uh, with insecticides because scales are a broad range of pests but the armored scales are especially difficult to control because they are in fact armored right they have a hard shell on them, and you can spray that hard shell with all kinds of stuff, and it'll just literally roll right off their back. And so, you know, uh, these neonicotinoids have some effect through their systemic activity, which they can get up into the plant tissue, and, and then the insect can feed on it. But we've been trying to control this scale we're having a lot of trouble getting, you know, shipping Christmas trees and ornamental plants um, out of state because of pests. And one of our main pest problems right now for shipping out of state is scales. And specifically with us, because we work with Christmas trees a lot, is this elongated hemlock scale. Because, you, you know, you, it's hard to get 100% control of this. <coughs> And so you get your tree, and you can't see these scales. There might be just a few on them. In the house, everything's fine. Then you chunk it out in the yard after Christmas. And the concern is in Georgia or Virginia or Texas, is that elongated hemlock scale going to jump on your ficus or your camellia or your cryptomeria or something else and then cause more of a problem? And... Um, you know, one meeting we had, as we're, we're hired, we, we've hired a new entomologist to work with the state, um, was one of the big growers said, you know, Wisconsin or somewhere said, we don't want your Fraser fir Christmas trees because you're shipping scale up here, and we don't want that scale. And we start losing states that won't let us bring our trees in, then we've got a problem. <laughs> and, on and, yeah. our commodity. And scale, scale wasn't a problem until we got hemlock woolly adelgid. Yeah. So, so when, when we first started get in Avery, you could walk across, the, you used, used to be able to, you can't do it anymore. You used to be able to walk, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You used, you used walk across the county and never step out of the Fraser fir field. But at the same time, you couldn't also step out of hemlocks. And so when hemlock woolly adelgid came in, you know, our first tree with hemlock woolly adelgid I found in 97, it was at Grandfather, there was a, by the parkway at Christus, at Christus Country Store over in Pinola. And the day after that, I went over to see Pete and drove up there and they had it, they had it up there as well. So it was like within two weeks, two locations had it. And within about a year, every, lo every location I looked at in Avery had, had Hemlock Willie Delgin. About that same time, scale started coming on to be a, a, a major problem. And this is, this is a picture of the scale and, and we'll sort of go through this thing. Uh, the life cycle with the longer hemlock scales has two overlapping life cycles, and, and I can never say that's async, asynchronous. Is that correct? So that means you have all life cycle, all life stages at the same time. Some scales you have all the crawlers at one time, and then you have all the adults at one time. With a longer hemlock scale, you have crawlers throughout the entire year, um, and, and and they will once they have. Crawlers, they'll crawl, they crawl out, and once they find a good feeding spot, they molt and they stay right there. Um, the females will never move again, 
but the males will stay there until they mature. And at that point in time, they will, they will go out and, and uh, uh, fly for a couple of days and mate and die. So the, the picture on the left is where the Forest Service said we had a long and hemlock scale. The picture on the right is where we have it now. Uh, so it has, it has spread quite a bit. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the, one of the things that, that Jill Sabato did before she retired is she did a research project with Florida looking at the species of plants that Florida was concerned about. Well, they had to go down to the Arboretum in Atlanta to get these, these, these endangered plants and they were being grown underneath hemlocks that had scale had had a, had a scale on it. So we're like, okay, that's a toss up. Um, so the immature of the females have three stages of development, and the males have those three stages plus two more: a, pup a pre pupa and a pupa stage. Uh, they have no mouth. Males have no mouth parts. They fly for a couple of days. They mate and they die. Uh, but it takes 16 weeks for it to complete its life cycle. But again, you have at multiple stages across the whole whole situation. The symptoms of it on Fraser, which is usually with, with hemlocks before the Adelgid. I think Lear, there was one tree that Lear brought my attention out there on 221 in Fosco on Church Road that had scale. And that was like the first scale we ever saw on a hemlock. And uh, it was it was most in the Sinclair and Johnson book had, had a listing in there saying that scale will not kill the hemlocks. But in that particular case, scale kill the hemlock. And once the adelgid came in and weakened the trees, it's like the scale just proliferated and came on there. Then it jumped onto the Frasers, which was next door. So the symptoms on Frasers, if you can see that, is a modeling, like a yellow look. That's a heavy population. And then in, in around May or June, you'll see that white fluff. And one of the things we found out about the white fluff is, again, since it has all life stages at all times of the year, when you get a cut, chirp out and leave the flocking. Um, and so that's, that's one way we can tell whether those, these guys are very difficult to tell if, they, if you kill them on a, in a treatment. The easiest, huh? Fortunately, they don't bite the kids or stain the yeah. carpet yeah. because yeah. that's <laughs> other bugs that's we other have. Yeah. Also, yeah. yeah, they but just kind of, it's an aesthetic the, thing. The Department of Agriculture is getting upset when they see stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. um, let's see if I go back. Let's see. Okay. So here's just some more more symptoms uh, of, of what it looks like. And again, uh, they're pretty unsightly. As far as what the tree looks like, you can have a tree that looks perfect and, and still have scale problems. Um, so here's the issues facing, if you're trying to come up with a way to manage this pest, here's the situation you have. You have multiple stages, so you just can't spray one or two times. You have to spray at the right time. Um, Long-term life cycle. You know, the, the females can be good for a year or more. So therefore they can lay eggs and get mate again, lay eggs and keep on going. Um, there's very few pesticides that are effective. And on the landscape side of things, you only have really one or two right now. Uh, hopefully we can, we can, we're gonna be playing with some insect growth regulators, uh, such as distance or fulcrum, as well as with safari. Um, but even in the Christmas trees, the only other chemical we have that y'all don't have would be dimethoate, which is an OP which kills everything it touches. So, we, you know, you don't really want to, that's not really a good choice, um, but by the same token, it is, right now is one of the few choices we have. Um, they're very, they can be very hard to see. So like when you're scouting, you know, I was helping a graduate student scout and we were scouting these, these uh, blocks of trees and they look, they look great. And we look and look and look and we find two or three trees out of a hundred with this particular pest on it. Well, if you don't control it then, it's going gonna, it's gonna to continue to go through the whole field. And we do have a predator, um, a, a little little wasp, I can't think of the name, Citrina, um, that'll attack it. But it doesn't get a high enough population to beat the scale back. Scale would wind up with like 60% death every given year. It, well, that's for, for agricultural purposes. It doesn't beat it back, but what we've observed, like working with hemlocks around in the forest or around these developments, is that the um, the scale will outbreak and be like, whoa, you know, we'll look at this and like really present itself. And then over the next two or three years, these wasp populations will build up 
and it kind of brings it down. Mm -hmm. Like you said, the 60%, yeah. it brings it down to where the tree can tolerate it a little more. Um, even, even in Fraser's, you know, we're, we're trying to find chemicals that will enhance that particular predator so that we don't have to keep reinventing the wheel every, every, every year. Um, and the last thing that makes it more difficult to work IPM with the long gauge hemlock scale is that this pest is regulated. So in Florida, if you drive down to Florida with a Fraser fir and they inspect it, and you have a whole truckload of Fraser fir, and they inspect all you know the 700 plus size trees on there, if they find one scale on one branch on one tree, they stop the load and send it back. So they expect 100% control, and there's nothing that'll give you 100% control. So there's five states, five or six states right now that will do that. Florida being the, the biggest, because that's the largest part of our market. And so our guys are trying to have to make clean trees, which is impossible. Um, so we have strategies like, okay, when, when they're bailed up, since they're on the backside of the needle, when the trees are bailed up, they're easier to see. And so we try to get the guys to teach their workers to identify and we, when we're shipping to Florida, you segregate. You, you take, okay, this got scale. We're going to put it in this pile. It's not going to go to Florida. Send, this one. send it to Winston-Salem. Yeah, send it to Winston-Salem. <laughs> this is clean, so we can send it to Florida. And, and that's going to add more cost to trees going to Florida because it takes more time to do that. But that is what you have to do in order to ship to a state that's regulated like that. We've also done work showing that the two plants in question, there is a, I think it's called the stinking yew, that's found in the Swanee River, 10 square, 10 square mile area around the Swanee River, that's an endangered species in Florida. Well, that particular plant is also at the Biltmore because whenever you have an endangered plant, you try to send those, those types of those plants to other places so in case yours die, you have another, you have the gene somewhere else to pull back from. The one in the Biltmore is sitting right next to a hemlock that has scale, but that didn't matter to Florida. So we had to show that it would be very difficult for this pest to complete its life cycle on, the, on those endangered crops in Florida. And even with that, they still say no. They still want 100% clean. So we have to do all these things like this to try to make it happen. Um, if you take a look at these trees, they look great, don't they? These are at the Upper Mountain Research Station. There's about 4,000 of them because we all, we, we scouted them one at a time, looked at all four sides. That's 98% incidence of scale in those trees. So it, even though those trees look great, if they went to Florida, they'd be stopped. So right now, chemicals are the, one of the few things we, we, we do. We can, we can uh, estimate, we can scout, we can look at the, look at the branches and try to go up and you know, pull, pull up on the side to see what's there. But at the end of the day, we're going to have to be able to treat with something in order to beat it back. And here's what I can tell you. Um, is that I've been treating five fields with a Sabanto, which is a, a very predator-friendly insecticide uh, for aphids, treating Sabanto in the springtime for the Boston twig aphid, and then coming in in June and spraying Safari, which is Dinotofuran, uh, which is a good scale product. And on the trees that have scale, I can hold the scale where it's at. I can't get rid of it. So if, if we sort of spraying a two foot tall tree and that tree had scaled that, at that portion, now that tree is five and a half, six foot, from three foot up, they're clean. But from a two foot down, they're not. If you start with a field that is completely clean, that, that regime of chemicals will keep it clean. But it doesn't fall into our IPM strategies. It's not an IPM strategy because we're, 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 we're spraying on a calendar basis in order to keep it. And we're increasing the cost of the tree but at the same time, at this point, that's our only option for that particular pest. So it's a, it's a. It's a problem with monoculture. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but you know, we're looking at new products all the time. We, we looked at um, trying to do safari as a bark treatment. And the difficulty about that is, you know, hitting a hemlock that's 58 inches in diameter with a bark treatment is a lot easier than hitting a tree with about a, you know, three inches in diameter or less. Or less. And then you're trying to hit it just right. Uh, the density of the trees is different. So the pest has more hiding, the scale has more hiding spots on it. 
but again it, it's it's a it's a problem that we have and uh, right now we like I said we're gonna be looking at insect growth regulators which are tend to be more predator friendly than others and we're gonna try to enhance the predators that we have uh, but again as a sense of regulated pest it, it's it's pretty impossible to to keep a, all the trees clean um, and again with the hemlocks next to them it can the scale can jump back and forth um, on from the from the hemlocks to the to the Frasers as needed and as long as we have that we're we're still we're always going to have an issue with that so um, are there any questions or concerns or I can say something yeah part of that has to do once again with the customer because our our Christmas tree customer demands this product that is the word we like to use is clean you know and if the consumer could tolerate a little more damage a little less perfect tree then we wouldn't have to be as intense with using insecticides and the other part of it with Christmas trees is you know it's monoculture it's growing that one crop in a small area you get an insect problem disease problem started it just blows up it's common with any kind of like citrus and any kind of you know agricultural product but getting back to what you know we're talking about hemlock and scales and hemlocks um, they're manageable they're they're not the threat that the adelgid is like with my clients that I manage hemlocks um, when we see scale you know I acknowledge it I can see where these little wasps have parasitized they actually drill a little hole in the shell of that wasp and lay Same. some eggs in there and and they actually feed on the scale but it's really cool science um, but uh, rarely do I treat for scale unless it's a real high value maybe hedge or tree that's um, you know very important Normally, if you see scale, you're probably looking pretty hard for the adelgid that's going to be there. Yeah. Because because normally they go they go hand in hand. They'll, they'll stress the one will stress the other. And uh, yeah, the other thing I forgot to mention about the scale that is making it more difficult is that it's embedded underneath the waxy cuticle of the needle. So not only do you got to get the chemical on the inside of it, but you know, there's one spot the feeding tube is the one hole that you can access the the, the scale insect at, um, or you have to catch the perfect day. When the crawlers are out running around, which will never happen. Um, in, in the landscape, though, what's challenging is if you have hemlocks that you shear or trim into a hedge or a you know conical, you know, when you go in there in the spring and you trim everything off, those scales are back in there and they're white and fuzzy. And a lot of people will be like, ah, adelgid, but it's not adelgid; it's scale. And for yeah. the homeowner, it doesn't really matter; they don't like it. Um, they want it, they don't want to see that. Um, so then the new growth, when it comes out, is not as affected and it aesthetically looks better. So, you know, it's kind of a challenge. And that's where you kind of have to know who your customer is and how you, if, what their tolerance is or how perfect they want things to be or, or whatnot. So. I mean, there's the dynamic ride of keeping. You know, if you treat for scale, you're you're putting pressure on those on those predators, whether it's Laracobius, whether it's the wasp, and you run the risk of of that cycle. Of, right. of, of well, there's there's at least two other predators of the scale. We found one out there, that little Skimnellus beetle, that little tiny black thing. That's a scale predator, as well as those two species of Chelacris, that solid black ladybug that has the two spots on right. it. Twice those are all scale predators. So well, we don't, we, we've not seen too many of the twice stab lady beetles so much anymore. Yeah, and I don't know. I don't think it's something that we're using because right right now we have been using you know, for the twig control with right. the synthetic pyrethroid of, of bifenthrin. And there's been studies that show the use of pyrethroids can enhance scale. And so now that we've lost uh, lost that product for the resistance to, um, uh, to the twig, um, I'm hoping maybe that'll depress down some of the, some of the other products. Because if you spray tall star out there or bifenthrin out there, you're wiping the world clean. Oh, yeah. you're, you're taking out everything there is 
And I'm hoping that with the less use of that, then maybe that might, I have seen some uh, um, green and brown uh, wings, lace wings this past year that I had not seen for about five years. So I'm hoping that some of those predators that we used to have are, are, are coming back into the trees. Yeah, and, and, and like we, we've, we've touched on um, with, with landowners or homeowners, and that, that tolerance level, I think we've had some of our choose and cut growers, and we've got a lot of choose and cut Christmas tree producers who, would, who I would consider to be your, you know, middle of the road, middle of the road uh, homeowners. They've got a much higher tolerance if the, oh, okay, this, this Christmas tree that I've taken my family out to look at, yeah, there's a, I can see some old damage or whatever, it's, it's fine. And we have some choose and cut producers, smaller scale producers, who haven't sprayed anything, any chemical for any pest for three to four to five years. I don't know, some are, they're not truly organic yet. Yeah, every now and then they'll get a flare up of something that they have to treat. But the, the, the predator presence is, is enormous in those trees that have not been treated for X number of years. But they have a customer base that's more tolerant of a little bit of damage. Now when you get into large scale Christmas tree growers that have set clientele, the same as the homeowners yeah. in the gated communities with the treasure, you know, the folks who bought this, this you know, 8,000 square foot house because of the 400 year old hemlock in, in the yard, they don't have, you know, they have zero tolerance yeah, whatsoever. Right. Whereas that, whereas that, you know, the choose and cut customer is, is like we are here at the ag building. Yep, we've got, we've got hemlocks here. Do they have to be clean? No. So it's. Right. When people talk about organic Christmas tree growers and organic whatever, there's a difference, and we talk about it, there's a difference between organic and neglected. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like just because you planted some trees and let them grow, that doesn't really make them organic. I mean, it does make them organic, but you, <laughs> there are people growing Christmas trees organically, but they're actively managing ground cover. Right. They're managing pests with organic yeah. insecticides, and it's possible to do that. Um, but like you know, the product might not be quite as good as or as pleasing as a chemically grown, but it can lessen the impact on the environments and that's kind of what we all want to do. And that's where insecticides are heading. You know, insecticides are really heading this direction to kind of be, you know, softer. And you know, we'll hear a lot of the older guys like, oh, I wish we had chlordane or something <laughs> that, you know, when we had chlordane, we didn't have these problems because these chemicals were unbelievably harsh on everything, but they were unbelievably long lasting. So, you know, it, <laughs> in human, in humans, yeah, and because in they're the like now we have to spray That's... all the time. We used to spray and crush it, and yeah. Um, but what, and that's what we're sort of hoping with this with this tolerance level and with what we know now um, about uh, you know that predator predator uh, pest dynamic. Mm -hmm. You know, twenty. I, I came to Watauga County just over uh, twenty years ago. Jerry's been around much longer than me. He's way older. Uh, but we we had an active, thriving nursery industry here, where people were producing hemlocks. It, you know, container hemlocks, hemlocks for hedges. You could go. There were probably twenty. I, I, I know in Watauga County alone, we had twenty producers growing nursery stock of hemlock. Because and and. and when the adelgid came through, it killed that industry. It killed that entire nursery industry because hemlocks are still, and I, rec I make recommendations as an extension agent all the time for, for folks who call. And these days, these days, ah, my name's Wanda from Port St. Lucie, and we just moved here. <laughs> I, I get lots of Harold and Wanda calls, and they're wanting to know what they can plant in the, in the landscape for a hedge or for a buffer. And I always recommend hemlock. Hemlock is that it has, it's just such a multi-purpose, you know, tree for the landscaping environment. And they and they always ask about well, the, number one, they'll ask about the adelgid. And these days we say it is a manageable pest. Right. It is a totally manageable pest. Well, where do I get? Where can I find some? And that's been it's hard. hard. To find. It's hard, hard to find it because the industry ditched it when the adelgid came through and wiped everything out. The industry, the nursery industry, something, some of it basically collapsed here to a certain extent. Well, you know what happened? The, the industry collapsed before we really acknowledged the Delta because, you know, because I overlapped with nursery, you know, all of a sudden it was like fields of hemlock were going unsold. Yeah. And 
people were like, they don't want them anymore. And they're like, they don't want them anymore, but very few people said, why? <laughs> you know, and then, but then we figured out it's because this Delgin got in to New England before it got here. Right. Our climate's very similar to New England, and that's why we grow a lot of hemlock. You can grow a six foot hemlock in, here in Western North Carolina in about half the time that you can grow one in New England because our growing season is longer. So I saw people in Jonas Ridge and over in Avery County, you know, ship, they would ship tractor trailer load after tractor trailer load of hemlock in New England. I mean, I saw people send their kids to college growing hemlock trees. No pests. No, you didn't spray them. You didn't do anything. You just planted them. You trimmed them. You fertilized them. You dug them. I mean, one of the most profitable trees you could grow. Um, and then a Delgy hit, and everything turned around. But there was now, a guy in the newspaper that remember he wrote an article on cutting his last hemlock stand down. I can't remember that guy's name. Anyway, those are the fields we like that are the neglected hemlock oh, yeah. fields that have a lot of adelgid and branches that we can go in there and we can really collect a lot of predators. That's sort of what we call a field and sectory. And like at Virginia Tech, they purposefully planted trees, and we're probably in the process of doing that ourselves as kind of a little area to raise hemlocks with adelgid and predators so you could collect and redistribute. I mean, we, we'd love to see it come back. Extension, so I could, I mean, there's there's a couple of producers that I know that have, they're growing some hemlock, they have some ball and burlap, you know, hemlocks for, for transplant, but there's but there's very few, so. So it makes the price high. Prices are high. <laughs> if you find so, them, yeah. you're, you're, you can sell yeah. them in there. So if you got to know anybody, uh, you know, lands, uh, in, into landscaping or nursery production with an entrepreneurial spirit, it's the time, it's, it's right to, 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 renaissance that industry. And then there are the Chinese and Japanese varieties of hemlocks that are available mostly from Oregon and Washington. And the I have a Japanese hemlock called Diversifolia in my yard. I've got a handful of them. I've, I've got some Chinese hemlocks and they're immune. They don't get hemlock woolly adelgid because they evolved with hemlock woolly adelgid. They created immunity to it. Um, so if you ever see a Japanese hemlock or a Chinese hemlock, like at the mustard seed, where they bring in a lot of stuff from out west, um, Diversifolia is a really cool uh, hemlock that would be a great tree for uh, nursery people to be producing because it has resistance. You don't have to, we don't need biological or chemical control for it. It's, it's built in. Um, and then the National Arboretum has created a hemlock that is genetically resistant by splicing genetics of eastern hemlock with genetics of Chinese and they now have a resistant kind of like they're doing with chestnuts you know they've created this genetically resistant hemlock. so they bred it right they did not genetically modify and create it correct they yeah okay they bred as Chinese in Carolina and they naturally will hybridize, so they that's cross. how they did it. Yeah. They've never been able to do anything yet with Eastern genetics, it's just too hard. And then what they'd have to do is get a tree, then you're gonna have to grow that tree for 15 to 20 years till you get a cone, get that seed, plant it, and then grow that thing out to see if it's if that trait's carried along. And that, you know, and that's where all this, that's how this can go in so many different directions, you know. That's why they have three-day symposium about it. <laughs> and, you know, you can listen to all the different angles. And what? where is this three-day symposium? Well, they haven't had one in a while. They haven't had one since 2010. Nancy Stairs, right here in front of me, and I, and Jonathan Hartzell, and Anthony Laboon had the last symposium that was held in Montreat in 2017. Prior to having it, we had to meet with the Forest Service and tell them what we were going to talk about because they were too scared that we were going to promote Laracobius nigrinus to the point that they felt that it didn't work. Now, they've eaten a lot of crow on that now. <laughs> but the government does their, you know, like when we were in Asheville, 
That was their second symposium. That was the fifth. That was the fifth. Oh, the fifth. That was the 2010 one. But yeah. they haven't had any since then because none of this has followed the party line between you and me, you guys in here. Is you know if it followed the party line, we could probably still be having this and standing in circles. But it turned out that this beetle worked. And they wouldn't accept that for years. So, but that's human nature. I'm just, I'm not, I'm not, uh, this is what happens with any program of any value is at some point in time, you have to break with the status quo and say, we, you know, we're going to reject what we have there. This seems to work and we're working from data. It's a, yeah, it's evolution it's of science. Of, that's, the science that's right. That's why I showed the, the, the picture of the world that I showed, right? It's happening. Back in the 1400s, that was the whole world. It was just, just this little map, and it's obviously much bigger. Than Some people are going to have to retire from government before, and a new era is going to have to come in before some more acceptance. Right. And that little micro part of sure. this thing. Yeah, the people selling chemicals. Or <laughs> Saja <laughs> All right. Well, it's thank y'all. Any any f follow up questions? I, I won't say I'm I'm on a mission though with the ash. If any any y'all out there want to see your ash? You got a pretty ash out there. Show them your ash. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, I've got yeah. I work. You know I'm fortunate to be able to work uh, with people who have money to spend on trees, and at Elk River and well and I'll tell you this too. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't really know much about ash until I saw dollar signs hanging off of them Be and this ash borer came in because there's a tree at Oak River Country Club in the front yard of a property there and I always thought it was a big oak or maple and I drove by it all the time and then when I started learning more about ash borer I was looking for ash which is a little not as easy as hemlock to identify um, you know this thing's five feet maybe in diameter. I mean, it's in the front yard, boom. It makes the property. I mean, it's a beautiful tree. It's old. Um, Dick has a, a, a big ash. I have a big ash. <laughs> we, uh, always, we always knew that. Uh, uh, came up in the woods and I showed it to and, you. And like I said, <laughs> we, well, we, one time, well, we were talking about it's ash. Yeah, it's a good t-shirt. So what a good t-shirt. That's one of the things that we've learned from hemlocks is let's save these big mother trees. You know what I mean? Let's go out right now if you want to save the genetics of whatever X species. Boom. Uh, yeah, because you know, and um, you know, we do we don't plant ash as an ornamental tree, but there are big ashes out there. There's probably some on App State's campus. You guys have been treating some ash, yeah. Um, and it's one of those things, you know, when they're gone, they're gone. You can't. You know, we're going to be standing and be going, well, why didn't we do something? Um, that's too late. Um, so, you know, if any of y'all know of anybody that has any ash trees that are worth saving, I think it's, uh, we're, and, and like when we talk to landscapers, you know, if they point out, hey, you got an ash, you know, it's, it's threatened. And even if that customer doesn't do something about it, at least it makes you look like a smarter than average uh, guy that mows the grass or does landscaping um, and um, you know there are people out there that you know uh, would like to save these trees and they may not even know that they have ash you know in their landscape so that's my campaign now these days so this sort of concludes the kind of the, the, the formal program here uh, with extension at the at the conference center um, for those of y'all who, who I'll let Dick give details about this afternoon, which is sort of a sort of an add-on to this, that's really just going to be, uh, you know, with with Dr. McDonald. But I um, appreciate everybody coming, and, and and hopefully now you're you're armed. You've met the Beatles now, and you're armed with some uh, some new information about uh, about the the successful integration of this you know wonderful biological predator that we have here in the high country now. Uh, but what we'll do is, uh, you know, Dick, if you can give some details, but I'm, I'm assuming for those who want to continue this afternoon, um, it'll be lunch, on your, uh, lunch on, on your own, but then Dick, if you can provide details about this afternoon. Yeah, what we're going to do, the people that are interested here now, we're going to drive over to Banner Elk and we're going to go to Bella's Pizza just to eat lunch. 
and then about a little bit after one or whatever time we finish up, we're just going to go to the <coughs> front gate of Grandfather, and they'll let us in. And when you go in, you come in, and you'll see the, the road that goes across the dam, and we're going to take that road, and we're just going to park at the clubhouse right there to start with and look around, and Pete will probably say some stuff, but there are absolutely immense hemlocks in there that haven't been treated since 2007. So they kind of bear witness to the fact that if you're in a good spot and these trees are off in the forest like the beetle and the tree are supposed to be, <coughs> you're done. And what, just one last, oh. one last reminder, very quick, if y'all have not signed, if you need your pesticide continuing education credits or ISA certification credits, the, those sheets are, are right here up front. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.